Okay, our first presenter today is uh, Andrew Feldmar. He's a psychologist. Uh, he's been in private practice and psychotherapy for 44 years in Vancouver. Um, he was in inspired to practice a radical, a form of radical therapy by R.D. Lang, who I'm sure many of you know of. Uh, R.D. Lang was his teacher, therapist, and supervisor, and later a friend and a colleague. Um, he was introduced to research and the therapeutic use of psychedelics in 1967. His interest in entheogens in entheogen-assisted therapy has never flagged. He's published many books in Hungarian. He lectures, teaches, and provides supervision and therapy internationally. Please welcome Andrew Feldmar. Thank you. Good morning. I think the major uh, message that I want to get across today is my worry about uh, the resurgence of the use of psychedelics uh, in a spirit that I think is mistaken. Uh, I don't think the magic is in the substance, however magical the substances are. I think the magic is always in relationship. So I'm going to talk about psychotherapy because uh, I use uh, entheogens and I <coughs> have been asked to get involved in the use of entheogens in the context of psychotherapy, long-term psychotherapy. Um, <coughs> some people uh, uh, stay in therapy for uh, 20 years. Now, you may think that's inefficient. You may think, and I have been accused of encouraging um, dependency. However, one of the most dramatic things human beings can go through is somebody impatiently waiting for them to grow up. Um, <clears throat> it takes as long as it takes, and no less an authority than uh, Judith Lewis Herman a Harvard-trained uh, psychiatrist in trauma and recovery, when she talks about the first phase of therapy that she calls uh, establishing some measure of safety, security, and trust between the therapist and the patient, it takes as long as it takes. That's the most important line in the whole book. Impatience is traumatic for a child. So the therapist, even under the guidance of uh, we have to be efficient and we uh, could be accused of uh, um, encouraging people to be dependent on us for financial gain, that is not the case. So it was mentioned that uh, I'm a radical therapist. I am, but not in the sense that you think, in the sense going back to the roots Radix is root. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think anything changed as far as psychotherapy and the essence of psychotherapy is concerned uh, for the last 2,500 years, 3,000 years. There is no progress in psychotherapy because there is no progress, there is no change in the human condition. Uh, the uh, ancient Greek uh, therapist, Theraputai, were the skeptics. And they thought that uh, uh, any psychological problems arose from uh, having dogmas. So the skeptics were the therapists of the dogmatics. And the major question that a skeptic asked, and usually skeptics made no statement, is are you sure? Uh, there are many autobiographies of madmen and madwomen. Without exception, when uh, they are returning from the height of madness, which really is a se separate reality, um, <coughs> uh, alternate to the common agreed upon reality, as they are returning to common sense, um, that turning back has always been marked by doubt. Uh, 
the sign of madness is certainty. Uh, the most harm to human beings have been done by people who have been uh, certain. Leading people into war, there is no other choice. Um, <clears throat> Wittgenstein said that certainty is a tone of voice. Well, I've been cultivating it, but uh, uh, I'm giving you a warning. If by any chance I hit that tone of voice, doubt it. <laughs> One of my first uh, conversations with R.D. Lang uh, when I arrived in London, England in 1974, uh, hoping to get into supervision and psychotherapy with him, um, we shared uh, experiences uh, that we had uh, on LSD. And we agreed, wow, unitive experience, death, rebirth, uh, crucifixion and resurrection, yes, 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 wonderful. And then he said, raising an eyebrow, and what does it mean? <laughs> and that's where a conversation ended, because nobody knows what it means. The only thing he and I were certain about is that we had those experiences. And it took uh, quite a bit of effort to describe them and depict them accurately. But as to what they mean, that's stories, that's fiction, that could be anything. Could be like a dream, could be an alternate reality, could be true, could be false, who knows? could be the manufacturers of what, 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 what a poisoned brain manufactures. Who knows? OK. So what school am I following? Well, I would say I'm a social phenomenologist, an interpersonal social phenomenologist. I think the greatest contribution R.D. Lang made to psychotherapy and psychiatry is that he thought it's a deep, deep, fatal mistake to look for pathology within a person. He basically said, we are only in the same boat. There is no us and there is no them. There is only us. And if someone is suffering, it's because somebody is treating them badly, not because there is something wrong with them. Now, of course, those people who are treating you badly, it's in their interest for you to think that there is something wrong with you. Children think, it's part of cognitive development, children think that if I feel bad, I am bad. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but many of us still at this point, right here in this room, still think that if I feel bad, I am bad. Not true. If I feel bad, it's because somebody is treating me badly. So it's interpersonal social phenomenology. Phenomenology because I'm not interested in explanations. Dime a dozen. I'm interested in what is and whether I can describe it accurately. It, in a way, diagnosis, the original meaning of the word diagnosis is seeing through. So it's like veil upon veil shall lift and veil upon veil shall remain. You describe a situation, say you're called into an emergency in a family. So you try to say what is. And if you describe it accurately, suddenly, a veil lifts. That's the diagnosis, the description. And once you describe it, everything shifts. If you describe what is accurately, everything shifts. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the end of it. Then you have to make a new diagnosis forever. And that's therapy, inquiry, just an engagement, a full engagement on a level basis emancipated level basis, 
engaging not, not knowing. Knowing implies power. Not knowing and engaging, basically entering into conspiracy with the people who seek your help. That's something. Now, as a social phenomenologist, I would say psychotherapy has nothing to do with medicine. Psych psychotherapy has nothing to do with psychology. Um, way back, Aristotle divided the sciences into three. He said there were the theoretical sciences, such as mathematics, physics, there were the productive sciences, such as medicine, architecture, and knife manufacturing. <laughs> and what, uh, what is common in all these, and why he called them productive sciences, is because there is a blueprint. There is a blueprint that you can compare the final product to and see whether uh, you did good. In medicine, if I break my arm, I want to go to a doctor. He's got the blueprint as to how the bones uh, should be in my arm. It's a productive science, just like architecture. And uh, the third group of sciences that he named were the practical sciences. And he named two, ethics and politics. And I claim psychotherapy belongs here. Now, what uh, is the essence of these three together is that you have to do them by the seat of your pants. There is nothing else. If you don't, you miss the point. You miss the moment. You miss the situation. R.D. Lang once, uh, a public, said, uh, <clears throat> I hope, as long as I live, I will never be moved by another human being. Never be controlled, never be told what to do. And then he added, and I hope that I will always be moved by the situation. Now that's already, you know, sounds very plain, but that's a spiritual statement. Because what is spirit? Spirit is non-material. So if there is you and I, and after a little bit, I think maybe already here in this room is forming a spiritual entity, us. And it's somewhere up there. Two people who get together and uh, marry or become lovers. And us is born. Now, if I move you, it's really sadomasochistic. It's domination submission. But if both of us tune into the us, and we are moved by the us, that's a spiritual experience. Experiencing yourself as a small part of something larger than yourself. Nothing mystical about it. It's absolutely obvious. Except there are many of us who are spiritually deaf. Your husband could be, your wife could be, and then it's your job to be the high priest of the us. And the other will not believe that you're the high priest of the us. The other thinks you want to dominate. Troubles, troubles. Human relationships are so much trouble. <laughs> so I think one could escape to psychedelics and spend the rest of one's life exploring oneself. Who am I? Well, I don't have a self. Excuse me. E. E. Cummings says, I am through you, so I. There is no I. We flow in and through each other. I'm not a skin encapsulated ego. I can't get to know myself by looking, looking into myself. It doesn't exist. If you're a social phenomenologist, you realize that's nonsense. It's solipsistic. It's narcissistic. 
it's avoidant. It avoids the terror of relationship. So, um, one more thing that took me a long time to re realize. What's the relationship between body, um, <clears throat> uh, psyche, and spirit? Because I read a lot about it, but nothing made sense. Until I realized that what's going on is, say if I'm a doctor and I look at my hand, or the doctor looks at my hand, then we are talking about body. We can look at each other's bodies. I am in a unique position. In fact, nobody can do it except me in the whole wide world, is to look through my body. Not look at my body, which I can do, but I can look through my body. I'm doing it right now. It's like I see when I look through my eyes. I, I'm not aware of my eyes, I see. I'm not aware of my body, I experience. Now, experience happens when you look through your body. And look here is metaphorical. When I experience through my body, you kill my body, I don't have experience. I don't have experience. There may be experience, but I don't have experience. Because I cease to be. The ego is a body ego. And then, for one reason or another, there may come a point in my life when <clears throat> experience is either very painful or experience is boring or I have experienced everything and then I can look through my experience not look at my experience which is what we call experience but look through experience and when I look through experience I glimpse spirit So, it took me a long time, I, I just give you this point there. Maybe, maybe uh, it'll make sense. The language we use uh, limits our thinking. Uh, Wittgenstein is a very good person to read if you're a psychotherapist, because he says mostly we suffer because of language, the misuse of language. Just because there is a word for um, <clears throat> unicorn doesn't mean there is one. Now, that basically, that one statement destroys psychiatry as it is today. Because just because we can label people this and that and the other thing doesn't mean that any of that exists. Um, so going back to my belief that nobody is suffering who hasn't been hurt. Um, the... Uh, Therapeutic use of psychedelics it really has to do with improving the relationship between the therapist and the patient. Now, any statement, like somebody says to you, take out the garbage, uh, it's not simple because uh, we humans are very sensitive to two levels of every communication, content and relationship. Gregory Bateson, uh, Paul Watzlawick, a uh, long time ago wrote a book, The Pragmatics of Human Communication. Excellent book, never ages. They point this out, but anything <laughs> like this that's pointed out, we forget very quickly. It's inconvenient to remember. So you say, take out the garbage. Uh, and say I get miffed, I get angry. Um, if this happens, say, in a mental hospital, uh, I start raging, uh, they put me in a straitjacket. So why did I get upset? Well, because it implies a relationship. Who are you to me? What kind of relationship are we having that you can tell me that? And usually we don't pay attention to the relationship level of communication. So if I'm a therapist and I communicate in any way at an angle to my patient, like from above down, I know my patient doesn't. 
I'm going to tell my patient what's good for my patient. I am going to unleash techniques on my patient. There is uh, damage to the relationship. We may not be conspirators anymore. I may be the leader. Uh, underneath it all, there may be a subtle SNM relationship developing. So Sartre, who wasn't a stupid man, almost to the end of his life claimed that there is no such thing as love. He thought in five minutes two people sit down and start talking with each other. In five minutes they know who is going to be top and who is going to be bottom. That's negotiated. And he said, the best way to exploit someone is to make them believe that they love you. Cynical, eh? <laughs> uh, near the end of his life, somebody actually loved him and he let it in. And uh, that's when he wrote that, uh, oh my God, it's like uh, all my life it was around, I just didn't see it. It's like show the Buddha to a pickpocket and all he sees is pockets. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he defined love and he said love is, you know you are loved when uh, you feel freer in the company of the other than when you are alone. <coughs> Can you take that seriously? You feel loved, you are loved actually when you feel freer in the company of the other than when you are alone. So that means if you have to pay for connection with loss of freedom, you're not loved. Serious stuff. Forget it quickly because there will be trouble. <laughs> so for example, okay, so um, just the history of how I got into uh, <clears throat> being a psychedelic therapist. In my work uh, with uh, Graf at Esalen, uh, I got to know how he does things. Well, I don't think he's big on relationship. So, of course, he encourages people to go within, like the Buddha. Go within. Be a lamp unto yourself. So he zips people into a sleeping bag, uh, puts on uh, eye shades, uh, pumps in music, and basically he's free to contemplate his own navel. Uh, <clears throat> it's not bad. I'm not, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's just not for me. I, I can do that alone, really. <laughs> now, he's there. If you stick your hand out and you're trembling or screaming, he will hold your hand. And, and that's big. That's relationship. He, he, that basically says he won't hurt you. And that's big. Now, in contrast, when I was in England and working with R.D. Lang, at a certain point in my therapy with him, he said, would you like to drop some acid? I said, sure. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, we made arrangements, uh, I'll be over, I'll come with a taxi, uh, I'll, take a, I'll take my dose in the taxi, so by the time, uh, tell me exactly how to get into your place because I, I need to know. I can't be fumbling then. And after uh, that, that evening, I realized that we didn't talk about money. So next uh, session I had with him, regular session, uh, I said, uh, so how much will I pay? How much will this cost? He said, no, 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 uh, uh, you know, I'm dropping acid. You're, uh, we're just going to do that, friendly, friendly stuff. And uh, I got frightened. I wasn't up for that kind of relationship at that point. Because that meant a free-for-all. That meant he wasn't going to hold me, he wasn't going to look after me, he was going to trip with me. They will, will do whatever. Frightening. So I told him, I was honest, I, I said, uh -uh, I want to pay. And what do I get for my money? Well, what I get for my money is an asymmetrical relationship where um, he's going to take less. 
I'm going to take more, and he's going to look after me if there is any looking after uh, necessary. He, he takes responsibility, and I have the luxury of uh, giving up responsibility without having to be ashamed. That's one of the big things, that when people are falling apart, or seemingly, or they're afraid that their experience is too big for them, because that's really what it is. You just have enormously violent experiences, and you get scared that you're too little to hold it. So you have all sorts of fantasies about exploding or going to pieces. Like, I haven't seen anyone gone to pieces. But I've seen people in various stages of terror So that certainly reduced my fear that um, I don't have to be responsible. That means I could regress. Now, you know, regression is sweet. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, you regress, then you have to progress. Uh, <laughs> and uh, regress, progress, I think we do it till the end of time anyways. Uh, till we die, we are regressing, progressing. So that was great. We had a good session. And about three months or four months later, I said, uh, I'm ready for another acid session. And this time, let's uh, have no money exchange hands. Well, that was a whole different deal. But I'm mentioning that because, uh, for example, hardly anyone I've been around, I've been in England at the Breaking Convention, uh, big psychedelic conference, nobody talks about the therapist taking uh, LSD with the patient. And yet, what would level the field except that? The moment I don't, you do, uh, there is an inequality. Like, I am... Uh, I'm observing you. Like, you don't have to be very paranoid. You just have to be connected to reality. That is the case. <laughs> you know, like what, what uh, you know, some, some acid sessions are eight hours of somebody turned to the wall and moaning and groaning and never looking at you and never saying anything. So what do you do? Pay attention. To what? You're waiting, and if the person says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm boring you, well, yes. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> what happens when... Uh, I, I'm not saying that I don't do anything to my patients. <laughs> but usually they initiate it. Uh, you know, work with autistic children. Uh, uh, Nico Tindbergen, who was an ethologist, uh, he had this idea of sitting down with autistic children if they were sitting and not looking at them until they looked at him, not touching them until they touched him, uh, not doing anything until the child did it. Allow the child to lead. And it and the children came out of their isolation because they didn't feel dominated. They didn't feel there were any expectations. Shandor Ferenczi, uh, my favorite psychoanalyst, uh, not because he's Hungarian, uh, said a good therapist needs only two qualities. Absolutely no ambition and a lot of time. Well, I think he said the truth. But in these days of efficiency, we can't remember that. Very hard to remember. So I came here to remind you. Um, <clears throat> so w w there is Lang. Lang basically sat down uh, in Lotus. I sat down in Lotus facing him. We looked into each other's eyes. This is tripping. And. Um, Suddenly, I had this urge to say, because it really was a conundrum at the moment, and I said, why don't I tear your eyes out? <laughs> and he looked at me, widened his eyes, and said, well, do you want to? <laughs> I said, no, actually, that's what was the conundrum, that uh, 
I know, I come from a very violent background. You know, I was a Jew who was to be exterminated when I was three and a half years old and my mother was in Auschwitz. So uh, people did that to each other. Why don't I want to do that? And so he said, well, okay, if you did, why would you want to? And very quickly, there we were, and we knew the essence of the whole thing. Revenge or avenge? I would want to do that because I would want to revenge something I think he did to me, or avenge something that he did to someone I loved. And uh, he said, why would you want to do it to me? I didn't do anything to you or to your mother. I said, but you are handy. You are here. <laughs> now, uh, what does that mean in my ordinary practice, because I do do therapy without psychedelics, there is a 20-year-old woman who came to see me who, uh, after she uh, found that she can trust me, she said that she was going to kill herself, she was going to commit suicide, because she was not sure that she's not a pedophile. And she would rather kill herself than hurt the child. And suddenly, that uh, exchange with Lang came back to my mind because this was a repeat. Here was a woman, not on psychedelics, who basically said, people hurt children. There is no them, there is no us. Why don't I? And she wasn't sure. She couldn't say. She couldn't say because she couldn't understand how those who do, do. And of course, there were personal experiences behind that. But the idea was exactly the same as it occurred to me uh, at that crucial moment. And if it didn't, I would probably have misunderstood this, this, this woman. This way, basically, what I ended up saying to her was, you know what? Real pedophiles, and I met some, never think about the possibility of doing it. They just do it, because if they thought about it, they probably wouldn't. Um, now, just two more sentences or so. Uh, I, just, I just want to emphasize uh, the us again. Um, uh, I'm not a Christian, but uh, you know what is reputed uh, to, to have been said by Christ, I pay attention to. He said, when two or more gather together in my name, I will be there. He didn't say one. He never promised to come. No spiritual experience when you're alone. <laughs> Absolutely not. Two or more, very specific. <laughs> uh, Anne Carson, Canadian poet, in her book, Eros, the Bittersweet, writes, Socrates conceives of wisdom as something alive, a living, breathing word that happens between two people when they talk. No wisdom for one. Change is es essential to it, not because wisdom changes, but because people do and must. Thank you. Sure, <laughs> but, but it doesn't count. <laughs> no, no, I, I understand. Of course, we are, we are, and and yes, uh, you know, Winnicott says, for example, there is no baby. There is no baby. There is only baby mother. There is no baby without a mother. So there is baby mother, and mother is the baby's environment. Uh, I just want to emphasize that people want to change their environment, even that not very often, but they don't think that the human beings you're with is the majority of your environment. Lang used to say, you're only as smart as the company you keep. Even intelligence is a social phenomenon. 
So after about age 16, you're responsible for the company you keep, not just the geographical place where you are. So of course, you know, the plants, the animals, everything, the, the cosmos is the other. But let's not forget our neighbors. Well, I don't know. Uh, you, you obviously will have to fight uh, uh, all the way, probably to the end of your life, uh, because uh, you know your your uh, editor is already uh, trying to muzzle you. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would say that uh, what a red hot branding iron does to the body. I mean, imagine. Branding a child or branding a human being like uh, they do with cattle, uh, red hot branding iron sizzling on your skin and smelling your own burning flesh. Well, shaming to the soul is exactly like that. So I have been envisioning and I have been trying to talk uh, even to Serbs and uh, Croatians uh, about how to raise children without ever shaming them. And they just laughed at me. They said, well, how could we control them then? Well, I said, you don't have to control them. And they thought they wanted to incarcerate me as being insane. No, absolutely no necessity for shame. I work with prisoners, mostly Roma, in Hungary, and uh, we do, uh, they, they love their children, these are all males, they love their children, uh, and so they are very highly motivated. Uh, the, the worst thing for them about being in jail is that they are cut off from their children. So what we do is, uh, uh, they write fairy tales and uh, they perform it. Uh, and there are these uh, super muscular men, because what else can they do except work out? Uh, with tattoos and so on, and they put on uh, uh, blonde wigs and play women, and uh, uh, they bring fairy tales to life, usually to do with prison life. And then the, the commander of the prison was kind enough to allow the families, children and uh, relatives, to come in twice a year, uh, Easter and um, Christmas, and uh, they can see their fathers uh, acting in a play. And uh, we cut a DVD and they can take it home and the reports are that the kids watch the DVD more than any other TV show. <laughs> so it's working. But uh, <clears throat> that's one of the examples of Timothy Leary um, went into a high security prison uh, and uh, uh, sat down with uh, people who have murdered uh, and I deliberately say not murderers, because if you say murderer, you shame them. You're saying something about who they are, and they are not. Like, even if I killed someone, I would not allow anyone to call me a murderer. I murdered. Those people are hypnotized into thinking that they are thieves, because they stole. So when they go out, what can you do if you are a thief? You have to steal again. But if they understood that they should feel guilt rather than shame, then they could go out and do something else. But if you think that's who you are, then you're done for. You cannot change if you feel ashamed. So, you know, my, uh, my son spilled a glass of water when he was about uh, two and a half. And I had the deep urge to say, you clumsy oaf, what's the matter with you? And I stopped myself and I said, hello, mom, because that was my mother doing it to me. And it al I almost channeled her. I said, whoa. And I said to him, look at the mess you made. And I threw him a rag, clean it up. Enormous difference. I said nothing about him. There was no shaming. He should feel a little bit guilty because that motivates reparation. And he made reparations. No big deal. Okay.
It is. It is. I'll give normal psychotherapy. Um, yeah. You know, Lang said, uh, just one sec. I, I happen to have it here. Uh, and I think it was printed uh, what his definition of psychotherapy was. And what that actually means, he stated, psychotherapy must remain an obstinate attempt of two people to recover the wholeness of being human through the relationship between them. Now, that's the therapist is, the worst has happened to the therapist also, not just to the patient. Can't for a moment think that I'm in a different category than the people who come in. The only thing on my side, why I'm not paying my patient, why my patient pays me, is because I've been at it for a long time, and uh, uh, hopefully had enough supervision, hopefully had enough attention, like with my son, to keep my mother out of the consulting room, to keep everybody out of the consulting room. Lang said, when actually there are only two people there, it's the end of therapy. Because up until then, there's a whole crowd there. And how, who knows how many people the therapist brings in? Who knows how many people the patient brings in? Hopefully, the patient brings in more than the therapist. <laughs> but there's no guarantee. Now, under LSD or MDMA, it's the same thing. Like, that's why I think, for example, in the training of psychedelic therapists, a psychedelic therapist should have a thousand dollars of uh, psychedelic, uh, supervised psychedelic sessions behind him or her. Like, burn out the karma. <laughs> you know, I, I was with a Tibetan Lama, uh, we were talking to an audience about the difference between East and West, which there really isn't much. And somebody from the audience asked, what do you do when uh, you have you're born with bad karma. Translation back and forth, he didn't speak English. So finally the answer comes out. You take a shower and wash it off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a psychedelic therapist would have to take a lot of showers. Okay, I have it right here. <laughs> In fact, I wrote a paper about it, um, and uh, that's the paper the uh, border guards uh, Googled uh, when I was crossing over to Seattle and turned me around. And uh, now uh, the verdict is until I'm 90 years old, I cannot go into the United States of America. Uh, because of that one paper, which answers your question. Uh, but basically what, I, what, what, what my experience is, both personally and with people who I have seen work this way, because uh, of course I don't do it, it's illegal. Uh, so uh, so it, it, it's very simple. Healing is in the direction of relaxation, not in the direction of effort. So, you know, I don't do work. Uh, Winnicott said the therapeutic space is a play, play space. It's about playing. And so psychedelics allow you to relax in a way you never thought you could. Majorly because at a certain point, if you do it enough, you get the experience that you die. And it's not like, oh, goody, goody, I'm going to have a death rebirth experience. It's terrifying. Every single time, it feels like something went wrong. And you say goodbye to everybody, and you go. And then, uh, death means nothing. Like, I'm not there. So I can't talk about it. This is the Eleusinian mystery. That's what it was. It was a secret because nobody can talk about it. The one who could wasn't there. But the miracle is, that's the crucifixion. The miracle is, when you trickle back into your body, when you're resurrected, it's not because you're clever. You haven't, your will has nothing to do with it. And that's when you realize that you are lived by a life force. You don't have to be religious, but you don't know how to liver your liver. You don't know how to kidney your kidney. You're lived, and therefore might as well get out of the way. And getting out of the way means relax. 
And I can say that a million times, but after a couple of death rebirth experiences, people relax. <laughs> because, you know, we are all in the everlasting hands of God, and it will do with us as it will, anyways. Thank you. <laughs>